Welcome everyone to Conspiranormal. Uh, we are slowly rounding out the rest of the year. And unfortunately, this evening, it doesn't look like Surfiel is going to be able to join us. But uh, I have pulled in Mr. Chris Corey, who you guys know has been on the show many, many times before. And uh, he's going to join us tonight. Hello, Chris. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I, you know, Surfiel is irreplaceable, but... Uh, yeah, that, that is true. He is, he is un, unreplaceable and irreplaceable. Absolutely. But the reason uh, I got Chris on primarily is because we're talking to our guest tonight, return guest, Maxim Furick, about the Philadelphia experiment. And uh, I know, Chris, you are super into the Philadelphia experiment and the Montauk uh, stuff. So uh, we might get into a little bit of that as well. Yeah, I think one sort of comes out of the other, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh, welcome, Maxim. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Great to be here. Hi, Chris. And uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to your listeners and uh, to talk a little bit about the Philadelphia Experiment. You know, this uh, 2023 is the 80-year anniversary of the Philadelphia Experiment. So it's been getting a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, attention again, as it should, you know, because it fits into that whole uh, paranormal and uh, UFO uh, mystique. So uh, it's good to be talking about it. Yeah, let's kind of just get into it. I mean, you know, I, I have um, heard about the Philadelphia experiment for most of my life. And of course, there was um, a very, well, I, I don't know if you call it famous, but there was a movie uh, that I watched many, many times as a kid and as a teenager called the Philadelphia experiment that I that I really enjoyed and I think plays a little bit into the surrounding kind of mythology of the Philadelphia experiment but let's kind of get into the basics of it and what what happened or what people think happened and how the story kind of develops yeah. well first of all I mean you mentioned the motion picture that was 1984 yeah and, uh, you know there were uh, I think three motion pictures uh, two with Michael uh, Perry and there was a documentary, but I think most people remember those really graphic scenes where the sailors were trapped inside the fused uh, bulkheads of the ship, and they were still alive. And just as, that was part of the negative consequences of the Philadelphia experiment. So, you know, it starts there with that that Hollywood uh, uh, display. And I think everybody uh, uh, starts there with the Philadelphia experiment. But uh, in actuality, what we believe is that uh, uh, during World War II, you know, the government, the military was uh, doing everything they could to win the war. Uh, you know, we, we know about the Manhattan Project and uh, Oppenheimer this year was such a big hit at the uh, at the box office. We know that people like Enrico Fermi were working underneath the uh, University of Chicago, uh, working on his uh, plutonium rods, and uh, you know uh, trying to uh, trigger some sort of a chain reaction to help out with the Manhattan Project. So there's all these experiments going on, including the Philadelphia experiment. And that allegedly took place in October of 1943, where uh, they were conducting an experiment. And uh, according to this legend, this, this mythology, uh, the USS Eldridge uh, destroy destroyer escort was teleported from Philadelphia Navy, Navy Yard to Norfolk and back. And that's the basic premise of uh, the Philadelphia experiment. Okay. And what were they trying to do? What was the experiment supposed to have been for? I'm relatively certain that it actually uh, actually took place. I mean, so uh, with all these things, there's uh, there's uh, kernels of uh, or piles of truth, and then there's a the conjecture. But what was happening during World War II? The Germans had devised these uh, these bombs that would sit at the bottom of the ocean. When Allied shipping would go over the bombs, the magnetic current which is uh, gauged in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, an element called Gauss, as they would go over these bombs, that magnetic current would go and trigger the bomb and blow up these ships. So they, uh, the Allies 
invented a degaussing technique where they would wrap coils uh, around these ships and they would go and use the electricity to go and nullify the, uh, the, the uh, gravitational uh, or the uh, magnetic pull. And it would make the ship not invisible to the naked eye, but would, would make them invisible to the bombs that were underneath there. So that was a common um, technique that they used. Uh, supposedly in 1943, it went sideways. Uh, they were using too much electricity. Maybe uh, they were doing this, you know, purposely, but uh, uh, allegedly the negative consequences, you know, their, their people died. People were fused in the uh, uh in, in the metal, uh, people suffered, uh, you know, uh, psychosis, just a whole lot of uh, crazy things. And, um, and just when we thought that, you know, this whole thing was over in steps uh, around 1995, steps Al Bilak, and, uh, and he gave us part two of the Philadelphia experiment, just when we thought it was over and done with, and that was it, you know, so right. there was more to the story. Right. Well, you talk about in your book and i want to definitely get into carlos allende oh uh, yeah yeah as known as carl allen yeah uh, from with the, you know, K. jessup and that's kind of the in a way the beginning of it but um you talk about someone in coal region who do that i i've never heard of as part of this and that is frederick uh g tracy and right yeah this is someone that um from what I read today about this, it seems like there is a there is some plausibility to something actually happening. What happened with with him? Well, a couple of things. One, if we're going to talk about somebody like Al Bilak, we should also talk about people like Fred Tracy. Yeah. And uh, my cousin uh, James Furick, you know, he was a Vietnam vet. He was a, a medic, and he was good friends with Fred Tracy. They both were living up in Derry, New Hampshire. So cousin Jim told me about this guy, Fred Tracy, that knew about the Philadelphia experiment. So Jim comes back down to Pennsylvania and tells me, calls him up. I start talking to Fred Tracy. And at some point I drove up there. I spent a weekend with him taking pictures and interviewing him. But Fred Tracy claimed that he was on the uh, he was a military guy. He was aboard the, on the USS Antietam. It was uh, an aircraft carrier. He claimed that they did degaussing experiments on the Antietam and that the men suffered. There were a lot of negative consequences, uh, almost like radiation uh, sickness. So that was the one thing. So we, we know that those experiments were happening, and it wasn't just uh, in, 19, in Philadelphia. The other thing, though, towards the end of World War II, Fred Tracy claimed that James, uh, Admiral James Forrestal, who was the first uh, Secretary of the Navy, uh, a tr had a uh, document read to the men on the Antietam, uh, claiming that, you know, because the, the morale was low, uh, he wanted to go and just uh, reassure them that things like the Philadelphia experiment had actually happened. And it was a document that he, that he read. And um, according to um, Fred Tracy, Tracy claimed that um, because of low morale, uh, uh, Admiral Forrestal issued a directive and it, he said, quote, it was then decided to stop the degaussing operation to see what was wrong. The ship could not be seen, although all the electrical cables could still be in a coil position as if being supported. The boat was not there, nor was there any member of its crew present. At the, and this is the, this is the Eldridge. At the Navy Yard, a mist appeared and grew heavy. Finally, the ship reappeared. When the boat was boarded, severe damage was found to the ship and terrible effects on the crew. Now, this was the narrative from Fred Tracy uh, as per the, uh, uh, the, the, the memo from Admiral Forrestal. Now, uh, was this an actual memo that one can see, or was this a... His recollection of a memory. It's his, it's his recollection, and uh, he had. We had corresponded for the longest time, and uh, I have uh, you know all kinds of uh, letters from him. Uh, I tried to track down crew members from the Antietam, uh, but many of these guys have already passed, so I wasn't able to go and get any kind of confirmation what what Fred Tracy said. But it it gets interesting because 
with Tracy, the combination of Tracy and Admiral Forrestal. Forrestal alleged, allegedly was with the uh, mysterious MJ-12 group. He's listed in there in the documents, yeah. Exactly. Now, uh, now supposedly this was a group thrown together to retrieve these crashed uh, saucers, you know, beginning with, with Roswell. And he was with, with in that. The other thing that happened, uh, Forrestal committed suicide. He was on uh, uh, suicidal watch, and he uh, jumped out of a 16-floor window at the Bethesda Hospital in Maryland. And, you know, you have to wonder, I mean, if you're on a suicidal watch, why would you put somebody on the 16th floor? I mean, not, why not keep them down low on the first floor so they could be watched and kept safe? So it's yeah, just... Yeah, that's true. It doesn't make much sense. I've, it doesn't I've make that argument, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and we want to throw in this, too, since we're talking about, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of the commonality. But with the Philadelphia experiment, Dr. Morris Jessup, Admiral James Forrestal and Phil Schneider were all found dead, you know, either suicide or homicide. So, again, you know, you have to ask yourself, what was going on with this? Is If it was a coincidence, it was just a, you know, pretty weird coincidence that three of these main, main players, I would say, you know, in, in this uh, Philadelphia experiment narrative, you know, died these, you know, these uh, mysterious deaths. Well, Phil Schneider, though, he, he never said he was on the boat, right? I mean, he was talking about was a, was a later thing, and he sort of got his start through Al Bielik's, um thing. Al Bielik kind of uh, introduced him and promoted him. It was kind of like a, uh, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, with this Philadelphia experiment, there's there's to me, there's these two sons, you know, like I talked about Fred Tracy and Admiral Forrestal, but there's also Al Belak and Phil uh, Schneider. Um, there was a preparedness expo out in California, I believe it was around 1998. Yeah. And these are the end of the world people, you know, the doomsday guys. Yeah. And um, yeah. so. Al Bielak claimed that he was the one that pulled the uh, pulled the the trigger, pushed the button on the Eldridge that caused the Philadelphia experiment, and also Biel, uh, Schneider claimed that his father was a former U-boat captain that was assigned to the Eldridge. So both Bielak and Schneider both claimed that they had some connection to the uh, Eldridge and the Philadelphia experiment. That's true. Uh, although there, there's a couple of significant things about Al Bielek, right? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, and, and let's say this before we start going into whether or not he was truthful. Whenever you get on YouTube and listen to anything by Al Bielek, this guy comes across. He is articulate. He speaks the King's English. He believe, I believe he had a uh, degree in engineering from Princeton. Uh, I mean, he talks the talk. He is uh, articulate. He has good recall. Uh, he's a great communicator. And uh, but again, you know, um, he, he's taken the Philadelphia experiment into Montauk and further. And, uh, you know, his uh, his narrative gets a little bit bizarre when he starts talking about time travel. And, you know, the thing with with uh, with Al Bielik, uh and his greatest gift, right, is that he could um, talk about this stuff and just sound so bored. Um, he, he'd be making <laughs> these speeches and he'd sound yeah, almost like an ASMR uh, guy, um, and you know he did. Uh -huh. um, he did uh, George Nori. He did. Uh, he did. Uh, Art Bell, the guy yeah. that. We, Bell, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, he did. You know, those guys really, you know, kind of made him and put him over in a lot of ways. But um, the significant thing to me about Al Bielik is that he was in the cryptozoology scene uh, and was friends with Ivan Sanderson. Okay. Okay. So he was a guy that was out there sort of doing the paranormal, like mi milieu, mm -hmm. you know, the, doing the conventions, doing the meetups. Then he sees this movie, The Philadelphia Experiment, which is sort of like a, a Hollywood, uh, sort of, uh, you know, Hollywoodification of, yeah. of this sort of the, the legend that, um, Carlos Allende had, had, uh, been promoting. A while before that and and sort of you know i think the movie came out because bill moore wrote his book right yeah uh, bill moore book comes out in 79 
Yeah, Bill Moore and Charles, Charles Burlett's book. Charles yeah. Burlett's right. Yeah, right. Um, the dynamic duo. And uh, I, the director, the most significant thing to me about the director of the Philadelphia Experiment is that he also made Mac and Me, um, which if you if you know Mac and Me, it's one of the most infamous uh, E.T. knockoff films. And he made a, a bunch of uh, sort of pretty cool low-budget movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philadelphia Experiment, if you were a latchkey kid uh, in the 80s, was on cable all the time. And Adam, that I was, know that, that was me. Movie. That was me too. Yeah. 80s, 80s, you know, it was just on HBO around the clock when there was like, you know, only, you know, a handful of channels on cable. So Bielik doesn't start talking about the Philadelphia experiment until after the movie. And prior to that he was just another paranormal guy and that's 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 the big red flag to me and then he starts bringing in sort of like importing more and more mythology into it yeah um yeah. i can't I remember saying. but when i was a ch- child i watched it wasn't outer limits and it wasn't night gallery and it wasn't twilight zone but it was a show like that and they had a retelling of the philadelphia experiment on that even before what, what, maybe one step beyond it might have been one step beyond it was it was shot in black and white and i yeah. i'll never forget the shots of the guys uh stuck into the hull so yeah uh-huh. sort of like the 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 uh, fundamentals of the the story of the philadelphia experiment were like really well worn by the time that al Bielik gets into the into the mix and well, um, he's a great story to, you know it's fun. a great story to right right <laughs> But yeah. it, um, but it sounds like if he was hanging around the um, sci-fi section at uh, Crown Books, uh, yeah. well, the guy probably was around the same time. Yeah, uh, he well, said you know, uh, Philadelphia Experiment came out in '84. He said that he he watched it in '85 and it jarred repressed memories. And he yeah. said, "Well, I was yeah. there." So that that became his narrative, and yeah. that's what he started to talk about. And you know, I mean. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, uh, so he tells the story, then he starts talking about Montauk, but he was talking about all this time travel and going into the future and all these, this, the narratives. I mean, he really pushed that uh, car, that credibility. And, uh, you know, well, and, 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 and Belix, one, one of the things that was said, well, you know, he pushed the button that did it, but he was a different guy. What did he, was it? Duncan yeah. Cameron was that the yeah name? right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and, and he, so he, so then you get that that like weird like they they age regressed him uh-huh. and sent him back in time so that yeah. he was old enough to be Al Belick in the nineties mm-hmm. when he was telling this story and the age regression is elements of stuff that I've heard come from other people as well um, mm-hmm. that have said this like Corey Good has made that same pronouncement. Um, guy that we had on the show captain k that claimed he was a martian super soldier who kind of Corey good said the same thing i said that as well so it seems like these these are ideas that like were first kind of propagated by al b lake and some other people later mm-hmm. on um, and b lack ha- had this wonderful resume you know engineer aboard the uh eldridge project manager or project director at the montauk i mean on and on and on you know he just uh got all these, said, assignments, yeah. all these assignments so did you ever take a look at the bielik debunked uh material um on the web because you know, that one of the big things that they they were they really pushed against was that he didn't have a degree at princeton okay okay yeah um they and, and uh i think i think it was something like they they determined that there was uh Maybe like there was somebody named Duncan Cameron that went to Princeton, but it's it's like the picture is a different guy. I can't remember the exact details of it, but yeah, uh, yeah. Hmm. yeah, I'm doing some research on him. He's a really interesting cat because like he he was sort of like floating around in the mix, you know, for kind of a while before he hit on this thing. And then I really think that he was just like the right thing at the right time, you know, because then then you get the guys like Phil Schneider and you get um Preston Nichols right. and just people are just eating out of the hands, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and Snyder's, and, you know, big, thing, uh, Snyder's really, big thing was really the Dulce base. That was really his, that was his thing. Right. 
Yeah, Schneider, uh, yeah. I mean, all, all, but but I feel like Al Bielik really kind of put him over in a lot of ways, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and the problem uh, once 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 Preston Nichols gets in the mix, there's kind of a lot of stuff that sounds like not not, not so above board um, with these guys. Sort of uh, some of the 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 Montauk related. Uh, things uh, that they're doing with other people that they're saying are uh, former Montauk subjects and things like that. Mm-hmm. Some, some troubling stuff that they talk about in the books. Yeah. yeah. I look at just the possibility. And, you know, one thing that, that uh, we should at least focus on, you know, we know that the CIA was experimenting with mind control on LSD. We know that the CIA dosed scientists. They dosed uh, these Johns visiting prostitutes, you know, just a whole lot of things. It's already in the record. And again, during World War II, we did we were doing everything we could to win that war. But mind control, uh, you know, remote viewing was one of the things. And why not? have an epicenter where maybe they were conducting experiments and why not Montauk, you know, uh, Fort Hero. So uh, some of that makes sense. I mean, you know that we were doing that, you know, just pick a place. And, uh, you know, some people felt that Montauk was that epicenter of mind control experimentations and, uh, and all this other stuff. I don't know about the, uh, you know, about the, uh, the kidnapped, uh, you know, kids and all that. But even, you know, for my home state of Pennsylvania, you know, we had Penhurst. It was a mental assignment, uh, asylum where they, uh, uh, man, just like tortured a whole lot of people, you know, children and prisoners and mentally ill. So, you know, we know that that was happening and that was happening for a long time before they shut it down. So, you know, I'm just looking at, you know, uh, some possibility and again, I think a lot of this mythology, whether it's the Philadelphia Experiment or Montauk, there's a kernel of truth. And even, you know, you mentioned the Dulce Wars. You know, uh, Schneider talked about the Dums, the, what is a deep underground military bases. Right. And supposedly throughout the world, there's all these bases under North Korea and Russia. You know, the old Soviet Union had their uh, tunnels and their underground cities just in case. And uh, uh, Schneider was just saying that he was a uh, uh, an explosives technician and they needed his services and they went down there and they discovered the greys and, you know, they had the shootout. So, um, you know, his his narrative got a little bit freaky as well. But, you know, at least the beginnings of this make sense to me that there probably are uh, deep underground military bases and uh, God knows what's down there. You know, and uh, I think there's always a kernel of truth to all these things. I mean, I, I would agree that I think the Montauk was probably there was probably some kind of mind control um, experiment or something that was going on there that later on just got um, blown out of proportion, possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, with uh, tr- you, you reporting about Mr. Tracy, that. Um, he was on another ship that was also did this degaussing experiment right. about like a couple of years later. Yeah. And that seems very possible and very valid to me mm-hmm. because when you think about how there's been a lot of very much human experimentation, especially in the military. I mean, if you think about the nuclear veterans or the atomic veterans oh, having them look at the blast yeah. Yeah. right and and the yeah. and the the cancers and the issues yeah. that they have sure. had it, yeah. it it is very similar to what uh tracy is reporting with right. this degaussing experiment right. so um it's entirely possible that they were doing this experiment whether the ship disappeared and was teleported to norfolk or not i don't know but but it's very possible that from that those experiments you get uh, that's the kernel of truth and everything just kind of builds from there yeah and uh, I, I, pretty likely right that they were yeah. i mean you know that they would continue the degaussing experiments because they the, at that time you know the the hulls of those ships still had a magnetic signature mm-hmm. and so right. you'd uh, still be trying to avoid uh you know uh, underwater mines right I, 
but but where it starts is where uh the, the next thing i wanted to talk about was morris k jessup and carl allen otherwise known as carl's carlos allende um like that seems to be where i guess for lack of a better term the mythology kind of starts yeah it, and it got the attention of the military too so right carl allen right. well carl allen or Carlos Allende, he was from New Kensington, Pennsylvania. And what he did was he got a copy of Morris Jessup's uh, book, uh, The Case for the UFO. And so he had all these annotations in different colors on the side of the book. And it looked like there were three different people talking about anti-gravity devices and all this. He sent one of these to the um, uh, the Navy uh, Office of the Naval Research. He, called, he labeled it Happy Easter. So uh, the uh, military called uh, Jessup in, showed him this book you know, with the annotations, and he goes, yeah, I've been getting all this stuff from this guy, Carl Allen. You know, I mean, he was getting like hundreds and hundreds of letters with these annotations. So um, the, uh, the government just wanted to know if somebody knew something that they didn't, if they knew anything about anti-gravity devices, et cetera. What happened was, allegedly, Jessup allegedly found out the secret. He was going to go and reveal the secret to uh, Dr. Valentine. And the night before they were going to have the meeting, he was. they found him, they discovered his body in this parking lot in Miami. He had committed suicide. It looked like he ran a hose from the exhaust into the car and committed, committed suicide that way. Uh, you know, some people felt that... Um, uh, you know, this was just uh, that he was murdered. And there was a book called uh, uh, David Ritchie's book, UFO, The Definitive Guide to Unidentified Flying Objects and Related Phenomena. He said that uh, he felt that Jessup was silenced because of what he knew. So, again, that's his conjecture. But it didn't seem to make sense because, according to this Dr. Valentine, Jessup had information that he was going to reveal. And, you know, the timing was... Timing was pretty bizarre. I was able to contact the um, National Archives and Records Administration. There was a guy named Richard A. Von Donhoff, and he wrote to me, he responded. He said this about the Philadelphia experiment. This is his quote. As far as the Department of the Navy can determine, the fictitious story of the destroyer, USS Eldridge, from the Delaware River off the League Island Navy Yard to Hampton Roads, back in 1943, began as a practical joke among staff members of the Naval Research Laboratory here in Washington. The humorous commentary on a theoretical paper on electromagnetism got out of hand and soon uh, achieved the status of fact and legend. The one thing that I get from this document, I mean, this isn't typical military Pentagon jargon, usually that's very straight laced and academic, but he throws things in like fictitious story, um, humorous commentary, practical joke. I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, we always talk about government cover ups. This just seems to be another a bit of denial, uh, you know, about anything that might have happened. So and that again, that was from the National Archives and Records administration like i said i think there's definitely a kernel of truth <laughs> I know. and like yeah. carl out uh, i don't think it was based on a practical joke or well, whatever carl Allen was uh known to be prone to delusions right yeah pretty much they you know yeah. uh, but but even they talk about the mysterious carl allen and supposedly he wasn't that mysterious and he wasn't hard that hard to track down and find and uh so, but uh, I think uh, he had some issues, and I also think he was a bit of a hoaxer or a practical joker, and he took this as far as he could, and he kind of like single-handedly, uh, you know, uh, scripted this uh, Philadelphia Experiment narrative, and then uh, Belak stepped in there and took it a little bit further. You know, I always wondered um, if the... The, the what is it the vero uh version of the book that's what they call it with the three colors of ink yeah, that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i always wondered if that was some kind of um some kind of uh um sort of like spy communique or something or that if uh if the reason that uh official people maybe took interest in it is they were wondering if someone was passing messages um 
you know, I don't know what that would be, but the, yeah, the way no, that it's written, you know, there's like a lot of strange turns of phrase yeah. and the color coding and things like yeah. that. Yeah, that, that's a good theory. Uh, it's my understanding that the government just had a whole bunch of copies made, duplicated, I think down in Texas. And, uh, and, uh, and they were, and I think there's still, you could still buy those, I believe on, on the, uh, maybe it's been reproduced. Top. Yeah. Yeah. There was, I forget who, uh, what, what, office it was mailed to but it, it was sort of like it wasn't officially investigated maybe but that some folks there took an interest in it and just it was kind of like a an office mystery or something like that that they wanted to find out exactly what all this stuff was right when they uh, uh called jessup in i think there were just two officers that were there two two individuals that questioned him and i sure. think it, i think it ended there i don't think that they found anything you know of substance so but this but the story continued from there and it started with jessup and uh certainly uh, fred tracy added to it and belak and uh and schneider um and a lot of this centered around uh in in uh Jessup's book about Albert Einstein's uh, unified force theory, where he was trying to, uh, uh, I guess, unify magnetism and uh, or, and, and anti anti gravity, uh, you know, into one one force. And uh, well, what's your personal thoughts on it, Max? And what do you think? Um, what do you think happened? Do you have any like kind of like personal? theories or thoughts uh, on the Philadelphia experiment? Yeah, I think that, you know, during the war years, I think that there were, there were, there was just a tr tremendous number of experimentations that were happening pretty much at the same time. Uh, you, you know, uh, Philadelphia experiment being one of them, uh, you know, the Manhattan project, you know, uh, you know, LSD and mind control uh, experimentations. I mean, all that. I think a lot of this was happening not only with us, but with the Germans and also with the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, a lot of this was maybe, um, you know, off the books, off the record. You know, we talk right now about the black uh, budgets that you have uh, clandestine, uh, secretive government organizations that are funded, but it's really hard to go and connect the dots and find out who they are and where they are. And a lot of times, even with the, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon, you know, some of those groups uh, changed their name and became something else. So I think that something happened. I think there was an, ex uh, an accident. Uh, I think something bad happened. And I think there was a lot of denial and, and cover up. And uh, uh, I don't believe that, you know, Carl Allen claimed that he viewed the Philadelphia experiment. You know, he was a merchant marine and viewed that. But there are all these people that inserted themselves into the narrative for whatever reason. And certainly Carl Allen was one. Al Belak was one. I believe that I, I believe that Fred Tracy was truthful. I mean, I had time to spend time with him. Yeah listen to his narrative and i have a whole collection of his you know letters that he sent me and it, and, they, and that he sent to the government and uh, you know he was um you know uh, so he he knew things uh, he has since passed i do think that there was something that happened and uh you know we're getting drips and drabs of it and uh you know a, i don't know i don't know if we're being sent into a uh, into uh, you know the into a rabbit hole into the wrong direction but you know we you know certainly al belak uh sort of hijacked the narrative and uh you know so so i i, I think it, like again i think something happened but we don't know what exactly it was i think it was a, a government government experiment that uh, that something happened there was an accident and uh you know and that's about all we know uh the motion picture uh was uh you know more of a science fiction thing and uh you know, but um, so that's well, what I think. Yeah, and the role of Moore too, um, um, in the in the Burlitz book. I mean, yeah. because I don't think a lot of people before that book was published had even heard of the Philadelphia Experiment. Right. And of course, the because the kind of the success of that book, um, is the reason why you have a few years later you have the movie is made. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Burlitz and Moore also did this for, for Roswell, too. I mean, you know, before, of course, Stanton Friedman did a certain amount of work on Roswell and really yeah. was the one who really investigated and everything. But but it was Moore's and Burlitz's book. And Charles Burlitz, I think, really just lent his name to these things. Mm-hmm. Um, Moore probably really was the one who really wrote the corpus of it. But um, I really think that uh be- those two things become popularized because of these kind of really popular books and it feels like a lot of that is what kind of helps them muddy the waters like what do you what, how do you feel about that well i think that uh william moore helped to muddy the waters you know yeah. I mean, he admitted that he was uh, uh, uh just spreading around disinformation from the government and right. uh, so how much of what william more research and wrote can we really believe and i mean when you know um you know what part of this was was coming from the government uh he claimed that he was getting information and in, in exchange for this information he would go and send out disinformation to the public so uh that's uh, i i think there's something else here that, he, that he's hiding i don't think he ever really told the complete truth and i'm not sure what that is uh, it may be easier to uh, to confess that you're a government agent than to confess to the world that you're making things up and you're a liar. So, you know, it may be easier to do that more mysterious, you know, that spy versus spy. So uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, what the real what the truth is with, with, with William Moore. But uh, to be really um, uh, pretty, like pretty earnest in his, in his interest and and even, you know, when he sort of came out and admitted that he had been working with you know uh the air force office of intelligence people um you know it it was he explained it was because he thought you know he was going to be getting access but i'm not sure he was even in touch with those guys when when they did uh philadelphia experiment colon project invisibility Mm -hmm. um i think that may have been something you know, he he had sort of met Berlitz um, in the late seventies, and I think they may have been researching the Roswell book at that point. I can't remember if it came out in eighty or eighty one. Yeah, you're right. Um, Maybe eighty. But uh, the Philadelphia Experiment book came out in seventy nine, so I'm not sure if they would have even been contacted by Rick Doty, because I think the like inciting event in that saga is Paul Benowitz seeing the um, unknown craft flying, uh, you know, over the air force base in New Mexico. And that would have been winter of 79. And that's when the air force OSI sort of gets in the mix. If I'm remembering that series of events, right. Okay. Um, the, the interesting thing to me is that, um, yeah, Moore was just kind of like the, like this English teacher. And um, somehow I can't, I, I just can't remember, gets gets hooked in with Berlitz, who already had sort of been publishing, he'd done books on like Atlantis and. Uh, yeah, he had a name already. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was sort of a, you know, classic, a, a lot like Brad Steiger, who ended up writing uh, some, some Philadelphia experiment books. Um, and then, and then they did, uh, they did the Bermuda Triangle book in. 1980 i think and then the roswell book if i'm yeah so my my chronology right and the bermuda, yeah, the bermuda triangle, triangle was 74 big. so that was first 74 wow I'm- and then philadelphia experiment was 79 and roswell incident was 80 so those were two okay yeah they were right on top of each other yeah that makes sense uh i guess yeah and the uh, bermuda triangle book sold like millions of copies you um uh, there's a book warehouse uh, near near where I grew up, and uh, I went there a lot during the pandemic. Cause there was nothing to do, and there would always be at least five or six different copies of a uh, of the Bermuda Triangle book on the shelf there. Right. Yeah. Those. I mean, those were those were popular consumption books. Like I can remember going to my grandparents' house and seeing those books. Like w- at yeah. least one yeah. of those books. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. was getting them out. Like a yeah. cult thing, yeah. Yeah. Well, they were very popular consumption, and but because of something like the Philadelphia Experiment, uh, the book is really what 
is really what kind of really sets it off. I don't think anybody had really, it may be around like the UFO circles, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was known about because of Jessup probably primarily, mm-hmm. but after that book is, is produced, is written and published. And then the movie comes out and then that's when, you know, it's become, it becomes part of kind of like the American mythology. Yeah. yeah. And Jessup was one of the first to be talking about the ancient aliens. You know, he was there doing that before Eric Von Donneken. So, you know, he adds a lot more to the, uh, you know, to the whole, the uh, tapestry of uh, ufology. Interesting guy. And, and I wonder too about Jessup. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, the, the, the mysterious death, um, you know, wh- wh- whoever he was on his way to see, it may not have even been about the Philadelphia experiment, but it gets the Philadelphia experiment gets put into that because yeah, yeah, of yeah. Carl Allen's, you know, writings in mm-hmm. that book mm-hmm. that he mm-hmm. sends to Jessup. Yeah. Jessup seemed to seems to have been a solid individual as far as, you know, his background and uh, I think archaeology, just uh, you know, a lot of things. I mean, he was an interesting guy. I mean, he has a interesting resume and, uh, you know, certainly one of the uh, one of the main players in, in this uh, Philadelphia experiment. But, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. It's an interesting story, and yeah. um, it gets it, it kind of gets told and retold, and and now I feel like people kind of forgotten about it just a little bit. Um, it's not as like um, told very much anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like with the Montauk stuff is really, I think where where it where it kind of really transformed into, and I think because of Al Belik, and you've got quite of other people that have hit onto the Montauk uh, piled on, material. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does that work? I mean, you have all these people stepping up, you know, like you know, uh, Richard Doty was one, and uh, you know, Schneider. Did Doty have anything to say about? montauk i don't remember remember him coming in um on that side of it um i I mean i think he was interested in promoting the sort of like underground base uh, yeah the the dulce wars yeah yeah i I mean he he kind of set that off um and and his connection with uh paul benowitz uh through the uh, i guess it was government disinformation there so uh uh and what exactly happened there are you guys familiar with that? Yeah, oh, it's yeah. a pretty, oh, pretty yeah. well-worn tale. Uh, uh, I, you know, uh, Paul Benowitz was was a ufology uh, fan. He started seeing strange things in the sky. He took some film of them. Uh, those things may have been classified projects, um, or they. Uh, uh, he brought them to the Air Force because he was a veteran. Uh, mm-hmm. He. Uh, later, you know, sort of linked up with this guy at the Office of Special Investigations who um, took some of those films from him or someone took them on his behalf and there was sort of a a, a, a gradual sort of ramping up of um, trying to sort of sow confusion uh, with, with Benowitz about this, um, th- which mostly... St- you know, there's like a lot of episodes and a lot of intricacies and, and players in that story. Um, you know, and Benowitz intersects with the 1979 cattle mutilation uh, conference out in Colorado. He's there. Um, you know, he he knew Gabe Valdez. Um, he knew Linda Howe. He knew, oh, yeah. you know, all these people. Uh, Chris Lampright. Um, that, that David Perkins, that whole crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, he's just kind of like in the mix there and he got caught up, you know, and sort of uh, swept up um, by the, by Doty and the people Doty was working with. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there's, there's a couple really interesting things about his case, but you know, I don't know, that's sort of a separate, mm-hmm. separate convo. Yeah. The other thing, uh, you know, Jessup did, did commit suicide 
Um, but I think it's it's worth a note um, because because mental health is a you know a real thing that um, in 1958 Morris Jessup's wife left him. Um, I think he was having uh, he he like moved from New York to Florida at that point. He was you know his friends were felt that he was unstable. He might have been having some troubles uh, with work. You know, um, I, I think he was trying to make a living publishing ufo books but there's kind of a low ceiling on that right um so a, a, a lot of people that knew him at the time said that the suicide wasn't entirely out of nowhere um and so i want to yeah i guess i, guess I, I personally feel like i want to i want to say i think he just killed himself yeah okay That's yeah. What, you know we we love we love a mysterious death in uh in the ufo scene but but I think I think maybe Morris Jessup was just having a bad life. Mm-hmm. He, he um, unfortunately was was depressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know it. It's something that adds to it. It adds to the mythology, right? It adds it's to the something conspiracy. that yeah yeah. Well, because it, I mean the thing that it adds is that there's like no real good ends for any of these people. You know, Carlos Allen or Car- Carl Allen uh, had. You know, mental health issues. Morris Jessup had mental health issues. Paul Benowitz had mental health issues. Uh, Admiral Forrestal. Uh, Forrestal had yeah. mental health. He he was dosed, right? Uh, with I, I uh, no, you thinking about um, who am another I case? Losing my uh, UFO UFO guy card. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Forrestal was the. Uh, uh, secretary the admiral the secretary of the navy yeah, yeah. The, who jumped the, out the, of the had a nervous court. breakdown and then yeah, they yeah. put him in yeah uh, you know maybe maybe that's something um i i mean that's a, that's a that's a that's a popular one mm-hmm. um yeah i think the thing about the philadelphia experiment specifically that's enticing is that it it was so easy. It was sort of like a um, an open source mythology that people uh, one of the first ones in the UFO scene that sort of anybody could started jumping into and being like, oh, I I have something, you know, Al Beal yeah. come, you yeah. know, and and now there's there's a few of those, and we've sort of like we've heard them all before, right? But um, the sort of like adventure story um element to it you know like uh, the way that al Bielik tells it it's like a um a, a comic strip from the 1940s or something <laughs> um and 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 i think that that there's like something appealing about that um especially like when he first sort of came came out with it and, and i think that's why it sort of endured for a while it was like a regular thing on the circuit mm-hmm. did uh, anybody ever call him on that any of the- yeah, I mean, well, there was a there was a website, like I said a little earlier, called Belik Debunked, and it was it was it, it they like systematically just went through his life, like okay, okay. Um, you know, had like gone and researched the background about him, and you know, um, and he didn't go to print like a guy that liked to tell a yarn, you know, yeah. and, and part, you know, he's such a like older gentleman at that point, anyway. That he kind of he kind of just seemed like he was just looking for something to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that I always remember is when he talks about going to like the 23rd century or what. There's like a part in the story where he's like talking about being in a hospital bed, and oh, yeah. he, um, he's talking about the TV in the hospital. Where he spends like a bunch of time describing like the TV and like the TV shows on the on the you know in the in the floating city that he's right. staying in yeah. this space age. It's like such a strange, a strange thing to, to insert into your story for credibility. Yeah. He was talking about the new world order. He was ta- his uh, ran about the future. It was almost like an anti uh, socialist thing, you know, talking about the robots and the, uh, you know, the human humanoids that were de- especially designed and all that, you know, so he had a, he had an interesting narrative, you know, the floating cities and all. Well, it was odd though. Right. Because he, he was like, um, you know, like, like for instance, like he was, he was helped by socialized healthcare in his story. 
Um, so he was sort of he was talking about it as like a one world government, uh, sort of like I, I guess like quasi socialist um, power structure, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's sort of sort of like describing it as dystopian, but also he's like, you know, I got all this free medical care, and like they took care of me, and like I wasn't, you know, like a lot of times when people make up these sort of far-fetched stories about traveling to the future, um, (laughs) like they, they don't get like a cushy hospital stay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and I think that's like a really like interesting and kind of funny, funny, um, the subversion, especially in that scene with, with people like, you know, not too far removed from like the Patriot movement and, and things like that. People and people who are, you know, warning you about that one world government. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be like, uh, sort of a- maybe by accident or maybe on purpose, uh, sort of making the, uh, the socialist, uh, socialist utopia seem okay. All things considered. Mm-hmm. Well, here's a, here's a question. Uh, I kind of like to, to 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 end it with you with this uh, maxim. Um, you know, you've just published not too long ago a a book about UFOs, and um, how do you feel like something like the Philadelphia Experiment or some of the themes? How do you feel like it fits in with the broader theme, broader ufological field, and? Are these themes that you have seen in some of your, your other stories that you've possibly written about in that book? Yeah, the, the new book is called Flying Saucer Esoteric, uh, The Altered States of Ufology. And uh, I think it all fits in, you know, because I take a look at the uh, narrative of, uh, of contactees, of abductees, hoaxers, scientists, you know, planetary, planetary uh, uh, travelers. And what I do is I take a look at folks starting with uh, the days before Christ, and uh, some of whom were viewed as heretics because they believed that Earth was the center of everything, whereas the church believed that God had ordained that it was the sun. You know, so some of these folks were viewed as heretics and put to death. But I take a look at it through all the uh, years and then end with the... um, 2023 congressional uh, hearings, UFO hearings with David Grush, and uh, which which is interesting. You know, like I watched that was in July of 2023, and I was up in um, uh, uh, a, a radio station being interviewed. So we had that tape, so we went home and watched that. But, um, you know, I was excited about it. I thought maybe there's going to be some government transparency. We're going to get to the end of this and find out once and for all. So what Grush did was he said that he knows where the bodies are. He knows where the uh, uh, biological entities are. He knows that Mussolini captured a saucer, got a, a saucer, gave it to the Vatican, and then uh, the United States got the the, uh, the craft from the Vatican. So that's all well and done and great. But where's the proof? I mean, when uh, where's the accountability and when's the government or somebody going to say, OK, you know, you already mouthed off about this. Now, tell us, show us, show us your cards. I mean, show us your cards. I'm like, we've come this close to the tr- to the truth or what we think is the truth. And then there's nothing. It's almost like this big buildup and then nothing. And so, you know, I'm like everybody else waiting for, uh, you know, the, 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 the next chapter where somebody will go and uh, let us know where this leads. And Grush is saying, well, it's classified and I can't reveal the information unless it's with certain entities and certain government people. So, you yeah. know, why don't we make this happen? And, you know, enough of this already, you know, I mean, we could go and uh, ha- have the information tomorrow. So, you know, I don't know who's zooming who, you know, who's uh, lying and distorting and, you know, all that, uh, you know, but th- there's there's more out there. And I'm, I'd like to go and find out what that is. OK, yeah, I'll, Chris, I, I want and when we're doing the outro, I'd like to talk a little bit about Grish as well. <laughs> but, you know, because he's, sure. he's an yeah. interesting character. 
<laughs> and, um, and at the same time, we had the uh, the Mexican uh, corpses, you know, the, the Jaime um, Musan revealed those, you know, from Peru. So it's the same thing. And he wheeled them out. And the uh, Mexican scientific community was pushing back. And a lot of people were, you know, and, and with science, what you do is, you know, when we get the moon rocks, we break them up and we give them to scientists around the world so they can all take a look at them and see what's in there so we could all compare notes at the same time you know we're not doing that with the uh mexican corpses with those aliens so he's keeping them to himself so you know that's a red flag incredible carnival barker he he just he has he has a gift yeah that's what he's been doing what's your favorite ufo story you you i just curious do you have do you have a favorite Oh, yeah. I, well, f- of course, you know, being from Pennsylvania, it's Kecksburg. Uh, okay. That's the Pennsylvania yeah. Roswell. And the, the interesting thing with that, uh, you know, so the, something came down, the military took it out of town under, you know, cover of darkness. And then with all these people like Stan Gordon, all these people using the Freedom of Information Act to try to find out what that was, all the information is either lost or redacted. So why? I mean, if it was a crashed Soviet craft, it was if it was one of ours, you know, if well, whatever. I mean, why? Wh- where's the where's the information? Why the uh, you know what I would call the cover up? So uh, you know, somebody's not being truthful with that. But we haven't gotten very far with with Kecksburg, and uh, you know, and a lot of people have been trying. So you know, I don't know what happened there, but uh, anyway, the very interesting uh, narrative. And then somebody, some people took it a little bit further that it was the Nazi Nazi uh, time machine bell. That, that the bell I yeah. So that the story got just when you thought that Kecksburg was over with, you know, we get another chapter or two that you know makes it even even uh, crazier. So yeah, I think that was Joseph Farrell. I think that came up with that. Um, that was because the he. Bell. Yeah, because he looked, you know, he was he wrote a book about the Nazi bell yeah. thing, and you know, drew some comparisons to that kind of weird acorn shape that the Kecksburg, whatever that it was, that landed in Kecksburg. Mm-hmm. You know, Stuart Raffle uh, is still alive, uh, director of uh, the Philadelphia Experiment, Ice Pirates, and Mac and Me, and I just think he could make a great Kecksburg uh, Nazi bell movie. You know, he did Ice Pirates too. Yeah, he did. I Excellent. What a resume. You know what? And Tammy and the T Rex. Do you know Tammy and the T Rex? Yes. yes. I, yeah, yes. where they put the brain. Like this guy is a is a is a filmmaking legend. So he was the director for the Philadelphia Experiment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The movie. Yeah. He okay, made yeah. the he made the movie. I think he could make a Kexburg Bell uh, <laughs> Bell movie. I'd go see it. At least <laughs> as good as Mac and Me. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that on that point, uh, Maxim, it's been it's been great to have you back. This is kind of a short and sweet uh, little discussion on Philadelphia Experiment, but uh, we are going to have you on to talk about your UFO book. But please tell people where they can find uh, your books and where they can find you. Yeah. Th- well, first, Adam and Chris, thanks so much for having me back. And I wish there was more me. And I wish there was more, you know, substance and data. But, uh, you know, uh, but it is what it is. But um, I have a website. It's www.maximfurek.com. That's M-A-X-I-M-F-U-R-E-K. And uh, if anybody would be interested in any autograph books, they could contact me. Or, of course, you could uh, contact Jeff Bezos at Amazon and uh, and buy them from him because Jeff needs the money so uh so anyway uh, right. <laughs> but, uh coal region hoodoo is my previous book and the latest one is flying saucer esoteric uh the altered states of ufology so check it out and thanks so much and keep up the good work this was a great narrative yeah. and you guys know your stuff and uh thank you uh, thank you so much thanks for sharing your your uh, knowledge as well nice yeah. to meet you it's been it's- it's been great to have you on. Um, and definitely whenever you, uh, what we'll, we'll have you on soon to talk about the, the UFO. It's called UFO esoteric flying saucer, esoteric flying, flying saucer. Yes, flying saucer even esoteric. better, yeah. even better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks guys. This is great. I really appreciate it. Excellent. We'll stay on the line with us. We're just going to close out this section and guys, uh, Chris and I will be back right after this little break.
All right, guys, welcome back to Conspiracy Normal. Uh, interesting discussion with Max and Furrick there about the Philadelphia experiment. Uh, you've been interested in the Montauk stuff for a while, so um, primarily, but Philadelphia experiment and Montauk kind of just go together. It's, it's uh, a classic, like, internet, like, internet 1.0 kind of like urban legend, right? Yeah. That's like yeah. you go to like some website where like the background is all gray and you like read about it, you know, when you're a teenager. Well, that that's what I did anyway. Yeah. So I, I have a, I have a, I have a soft spot for it. I wish there was, I wish the more fantastical stuff, um, you know, I, I love all that, but it, it, it's, it's pretty made up. Yeah. I, I remember, I, I didn't even know who he was at the time, but I can remember it was late nineties. I was just hanging out in my room or something, listening to coast to coast. And this guy's on, you know, of course you, you turn it on like midway, right? It's yeah. already going on. And this guy's talking about, Oh, I was on the ship and I jumped off the ship and I ended up in 1983. Yeah. And it was 1943, but I ended up in 1983, and I had to go back. And I'm like, what? "This what? This is the movie? Yeah, what this like, guy is saying mm-hmm. is basically the movie." And of course, Art Bell is just over there, just eating it up, you know. Oh, 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 oh. you know, and it's just, uh, you know, you know, it's like you already knew if 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 you grew up watching the movie, which I think that like he must not have counted that too many people saw that movie which that, is crazy but 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 then he said but but then he said like you said that uh once people confronted him about it i guess he said oh well when i watched the movie it was it all came back to me right yeah. and of course his whole thing was that he was this other person named was it duncan cameron i think so right yeah like he was this other person and he knew all about what really happened and so they age regressed him to a baby which they could apparently do in the 1940s which can't do now but anyway but so they they age regressed him to a baby sent him back in time to be and and he assumed the identity of al belick but in 1984 or five he's watching hbo and uh the philadelphia experiment movie comes on and he's all of a sudden it jogs his memory and you know of course the 1980s you know this is the classic time of like repressed memories and this type of thing too so sure and i mean you know i guess I, i guess they're probably they're you know if you want to go with the sort of the classic uh, conspiratorial slant, you know, there's a, a lot of people claiming uh, that they were a part of uh, experiments in the 60s and 70s and the 50, 50s, 60s, 70s, who are only just remembering those things. And then then you've also got on top of that, you have the, um, the, the people... Uh, you know the Michelle remembers uh, satanic yeah. cult stuff, and then on top of that, you have the abduction panic. Right. So it just everybody has a repressed memory in the eighties. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, that sort of also <laughs> sort of makes Al Bielik really dubious to me because he's coming around after all all of that, after all the other repressed memory people. Um. Well, then the Montauk stuff starts. Yeah. Right. But some point be like, kind of because part of that. that. And yeah. who are the other guys? Preston Nichols is the main Preston guy. Preston Nichols, yeah. Um, and he he is like, he is actually a really interesting guy because you know, I'm, I'm like reaching over. I've got my Montauk books here, but um, <laughs> he's like a you know some kind of a like amateur like a like a ham radio mad scientist kind of dude and he's starts saying well i remember being there too and i was also working at montauk as a scientist and 
you know, it's been like a little while since I really like uh, uh sponged up all absorbed all the uh all the media, the 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 Montauk literature as it were. Right. Um right. but he starts like taking people out to the base and giving them tours and none of the buildings were were blocked off or boarded up at that point and this is like the early 90s and so there's there's even a video i think he took like a japanese film crew out there and it, you can find the video on youtube and it's actually um it's a really it's almost like um you know in t- the video camera of like laura palmer and stuff it almost has that quality to it when you're just like really hypnotic kind of stuff um but he's going around and he's saying oh yeah that's the uh you know the seismic generator with the you know johnson coil that does the you know whatever you know created the monster that i you know just going around and sort of like pointing at different i'm like you're looking at it it's like that just looks like any uh you know like a generator or any sort of like um power source thing that that would be in a in a on a military base so and him and uh another guy who kind of get involved and they're they're they start doing these like regressions on on boys that that are supposedly coming to them and saying that they think they might be a montauk experiment and there's yeah, the like a montauk really, boys yeah the really heavy sexual element to that that is uncomfortable yes. right because the thing that they said is they designed this Montauk chair and they would sit people in it and it would push them to uh, a, like a, a orgasmic, like achieving climax point. Um, and then when they were at that point, they could uh, use the chair to create things with their mind or, you know, do all these other like bizarre uh, sci-fi things. But there's this, sort of questionable aspect of like what these guys were doing in the real world where they were working with like young younger men possibly underage i don't know i know that's like (laughs) i don't know maybe you want to edit this out um but they were um they were sort of doing these like weird regressions um and i'd have to find there's some articles about it but where the guys would sort of like strip down to their underwear and um, be like um, hypnotized and, and meditate with um, uh, Preston and and uh, I forget who the other guy. Yeah, is. it gets it gets weird and it gets disturbing real quick. Yeah, it's uh, really like it, it's it's questionable. Like it, you really yeah. have to wonder. Um, it's extraordinarily questionable. Uh, um, well, and there's there's this other guy that gets involved later, and mm-hmm. Stuart Swerdlow. Yeah, and that he had like he had a feud with some of them, I think. Yeah, you know, it was yeah. sort of I, the impression that I got was that he kind of uh, like he came in and was like, "Oh yeah, me too. I'm I'm also one of the time traveling, um, you know, super soldiers." Uh, and then he started right. adding stuff into the story, and they were like, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute! Like this this is our this is our grift. Like get out of here." <laughs> and so they had some they had some uh friction with each other like, he's the guy who said that he uh they send him back in time to get the blood of christ to like make an army of jesus clones to uh, yes I, yeah I, I seem to remember this yeah do something i mean it just why would you need to do that when you could just get the blood from the shroud of turin why <laughs> Why indeed, Adam? And well, it, it was something like first they send him back to kill Jesus at, so that they could clone him. And then he like got there, you know, at the crucifixion and he's like, I can't do it. Uh, you know, so he comes back. And so then they send him back and he just uh, gets blood out of the side wound. Um, there you go. Practical. Yeah, no, of course. Um, that reminds me of Andrew Basiago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Who came out, you know, later, not not connected with any of this stuff. Well, I guess peripherally, but like he was saying that, like, you know, uh, he was sit back in time because he was on Mars with Barack Obama. Yeah, and he was he was sit 
<laughs> Barack Obama was a part of this, guys. Uh, he was sent back in time to give Abraham Lincoln a message at the Gettysburg Address. And, like, he actually took this old, like, Matthew Brady picture. Yeah. And, like, points to this little kid. And he's like, see, that's me, you know? And uh, my, my, I remember when... <laughs> I remember, like, he was on uh, Jesse Ventura's show, like, back, like, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, they're driving by this house, right, with this guy. And he says, uh, he says, this is where I lived in 1973 and 1974, but not exactly in that order. Oh, my God. (laughs) These people, you know, the... The sad thing is, none of them are are really that good at making up tall tales. Yeah, like you know, because if you listen to those old Al Bielik broadcasts, they're so boring. Like he's saying the most fantastical stuff you've ever heard, but he's doing it like he's telling you about like you know a a day a day working at the supermarket. It, it's just so boring. <laughs> Yeah. Well, then I was age aggress, you know, and that happened. And they sent me back through the time tunnel. And then I. <laughs> you know who did a pretty good uh, Philadelphia experiment series was uh, Aaron Golias. He sort right. of did it in his very um, well, in, in, in the way that, that he does. But he really like pulled all the sort of elements and streamlined it into something that you can follow and it was like a few a few episodes that it was three parts he did yeah he did three parts on it he did uh and he, and he includes the montauk material in there as well no right, he did job sort of calling the various strains of bullshit and making you know weaving them into one bullshit tapestry uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then I he mean, said after it he said he was done with it after that <laughs> wouldn't you be <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i let's see what books do i have i have i have this the brad steiger al bielik book uh, brad steiger with alfred bielik and sherry hansen steiger this one is pretty bad um you know and it goes into it, it of course it has a, a chapter on the the darrows it's it's not even all it's like they didn't have enough philadelphia experiment the good thing is it has the um it has some of the classic um West Crumb illustrations in it from those comic books and from the uh-huh. Tim Beck books, uh-huh. you know. So um you get that in here. And then I have a couple of the Preston Nichols with Peter Moon books, and these are ju- this is just bad sci fi. I mean it's all bad sci fi, but this is like <laughs> you know montauk experiments in time montauk revisited adventures in synchronicity this is just silly stuff and then uh i have the this this montauk files one that doesn't have any of the sort of major players involved in it but it has um more pictures of the base itself than most of these other books have um and it's i mean I think this is from the early nineties. I I think when I was on the the show with you once, I I talked a lot about this book. I think so, yeah. Because it's like the only one that's sort of, I, I, well, you can't say it's factual, but it um, it's 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 not like built around a personal narrative like these other ones are, I guess, and and that's the distinction at least. At least you can just look at these insane claims um, as they are, and there's not like this sort of uh, whistleblower storyteller narrative around it. But um, and, and you've gone there, right? You've actually gone Montauk and it's open to national park. Um, you can't yeah. get any of those buildings anymore, but you can look in the window and see. You know, like I don't know, man. Uh, there's you you know people have taken pictures inside that one building with like the weird wallpaper and stuff and maybe they were doing and maybe they were dosing people with um with psychedelics there i guess um it would be a good place to sort of do something secluded like that and and you know 
maybe that's why the folklore sort of sprung up around it. You know, you're like yeah. three hours from New York. So if you pick up a runaway or a young kid who's who's a hustler at that time, you know, on 42nd Street, you put him in a van, drive him out to Montauk. For all they know, they're in Kansas, you know, like I guess if 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 we're gonna go with that narrative, maybe there's some plausibility there, but I don't know. You know, it, you're still. I, I'm sure things like that happened at that time. There seems to be, you know, some kind of coherence to the stories that you you hear about this again and again. But yeah, but I don't know. You know. And, and it gets dark quick, so it, it it takes a lot to sort of sit down and start to try and like sift through that and see what's really there. So, um, yeah, let's switch gears before we before we stop here. Uh, uh, yeah. I wanted um, to get you thought. Uh, what's that? On to lighter topics. Yeah, well, sort of. I guess. <laughs> uh, what's your thoughts on uh, Dave Grish? What's does he have anything new to say since July? You so you you took one for the conspiracy normal team and you were you tuned into his his Joe Rogan interview, right? <laughs> well, I haven't finished it. I mean, I got I've gotten as of when we're recording, I got like halfway through, but I think I probably got the meat of it. Um, I mean, honestly, when Grush came out your first impression is who, who is this guy? And yep. then your second, your second impression, your second thought is, uh, is anything that he is saying is true. Now, is it true because he's the one that's lying or not true? Cause he's the one that's lying. Or is it true that it from the people that he's, is it a lie from the people that he's getting it from? Are they telling him, are they giving him a line? Because he's not said that he has seen anything himself and he's maintained this, but it's all about the people that he's talked to. And he's very, um, you know, he, he went into like, he's intelligence. I mean, he okay. has an extensive intelligence career and sure. just like somebody like El Lou Elizondo, who's the same it's hard to really if you studied anything about ufos and the misinformation because we talked about benowitz and we talked about Doty, and it seems like this is probably more of the same but what's the reason what's the point i mean you know he he just and he's very in the interview he's very cagey and very careful about everything that he's saying. And it's like, so you can't say anything, but you're going on all these interviews and he's, it's also interesting to me that he has come out and said, unlike somebody like Lou Elizondo, like he's coming out and saying that he's a whistleblower, that he's doing this out of the kindness of his heart, because he wants the world to know that UFOs are real UAP or whatever are real and that the world should know and that but, he's suffering because of it. I mean, essentially like he's Daniel Ellsberg or somebody like that, but it's like he just, but I feel like he's just, that's just a role that he's saying that he's fulfilling. And he's talking about, in the interview, uh, talking to like you. Harry Reid and, you know, and, and Reid had that long association with Robert Bigelow. I mean, it just feels like this is more of the Bigelow camp, but this is where the shit is coming from. Yeah. Well, so like a, a couple of things about about this guy. So one, it seems like the reason that he's whistleblowing is is because he um because he feels like he's in danger, right? Like that's his reasoning for it. Uh, I don't know. I, I I I didn't really catch that. I mean, he said that he's been threatened before. Uh, yeah. So early on, 
talking a lot about like threats and and things like that right and i think that's interesting um because to me that that says well well to me one thing that suggests is that he's saying like he's making himself a public figure now so he's uh, I, I you know i don't know if maybe he's mixed up in something else or there is something that he was being threatened about and he made the decision to like be public whistleblower and maybe it's all in service of uh keeping him in the public eye so that he feels a little safer so that he feels like someone can't hurt him i don't know that's just conjecture yeah so, i th- um, another thing that i thought is uh i remember when the when the halloween 2018 reboot movie came out you remember this movie the the first one of these new string of halloween movies yeah yeah, yeah. somebody somebody i was listening to or talking i don't know they sort of like systematically um talked about each plot point in the movie and and, because it was supposed to be a new movie that did away with all the old movies right this is right yeah they um they went through and sort of pointed out which plot elements were from which of the old movies that they were supposedly tossing to the curb and um when i was hearing the gruce dude talk first i was just like well every single like line of this story is just something else from another thing and i think like everybody's sort of accepted that now but like he's just recycled like a bunch of of classic plot elements i haven't heard one thing that he said that sounds any different from like what i mean it's not that different from like the bob lazar story it's not that different from you know uh even something like what stan friedman was putting out there um I, I just it just doesn't seem like there's anything that he has to share that right all that different but there's a lot yeah. of people who maybe don't know that um right yeah a lot of younger people probably don't know that i would say a lot of people in congress too yeah um one thing that I thought about Elizondo and that maybe I think about this guy. Um, I don't know if some of this is like uh, being used as kind of like a gateway drug to pull in um, people that lean right, people that are like anti-government type and I don't know to what end. I don't know if it's like they want to redirect some of those people um, who maybe are like, you know, off on the far right to sort of like chase the chase the dragon of the, you know, unattainable UFO thing or. That's interesting. Maybe, yeah. Um, on the flip side, I mean, like, again, I don't have any proof of this. I'm just speculating. Well, you know, T- Tucker Carlson takes a real interest in it. Well, there you Shows go. Shows up on his He's show talking. a lot, you know. Tucker Carlson. So the, yeah, so is, the, is speaking to that audience. Yeah, so there might be uh, some that might there might be some elements of that. That's very possible. Um, it, on the other hand, it could be a thing where you know UFO stuff. I think of other people have talked about. I mean, I think uh, uh, what's his name? Nathan um was talking about this at at the strange realities conference that like sort of the ufo topic has been used as a recruiting tool into sort of like um right wing uh limited government kind of groups right yeah um you know i don't know uh i don't know i don't know who who grush is sort of tied up with um i'm sure if he's an intelligence agent he's mixed up in all kinds of weird things that would you know make my head spin just in terms of how complicated they are but yeah um, he is an intelligence agent i'm sure yes. yeah i mean there's just no, there well there seems to be no question about that right and and so 
uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know if there's like, enough to read between the lines on this yet. I don't know if he, they, I don't know. When, when, when this whole thing dropped in the middle of the year, it was like, mostly it was like Leslie Keene was behind it. Uh, there was somebody else that was also, you know, that they were all this excited. We have this guy, we have this whistleblower that is going to blow the lid off of everything. And he, and then the next question is, well, did he actually see these things? Well, no, he's been told these things by other people. And then you get to the con you get to the hearing and he gives his testimony. And then there's questions that he can't answer unless he goes to a different room, but not on camera. And it's just kind of was like a dud. And you don't really hear from him for a few months. And now he's on he's making the podcast rounds. He's on Joe Rogan. Well, if he's doing the podcast rounds. To me, that also suggests that, like, any sort of official engagement with him is yeah. probably fun. Because that might be true. Joe Rogan, if you're if you're having uh, if you're having you know uh, meetings with but, people on Capitol Hill, but as a whistleblower, like he he's saying, but even as a whistleblower, he's saying things that, like, I don't know. I feel like you go be a whistleblower you're going to be like okay that you're going to reveal what you know mm -hmm. right even if it's on like media but he's not doing that he's like still kind of just like well i can't tell you what that is i have to be careful about what i say not you don't see many whistleblowers that that say those type of things right i mean daniel ellsberg i mean i bring him up reveals the pentagon papers was Daniel Ellsberg after that cagey about what was in the Pentagon Papers? No. You know, so it does, I don't know, just it's things like that just don't make any real sense to me. You know, he seems like he, I mean, and, and, he, and he's talking about how, like, I was just kind of muttering to myself when, I, when he's talking about how I've just really lost a lot and I've really just like financially I've taken a hit and I'm thinking, don't worry, Dave, I'm sure you're set, bro. Yeah. I'm sure somebody's bankrolling this guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I, I mean, the story that he's telling is is pretty clearly not the whole story. Um, it is interesting that he got access to like a, a full, you know, congressional sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, a hearing or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't know what, what exactly to make of that. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. I don't know why you wheel that guy out and do that. Um, I feel like Leslie Kane was, was, you know, sort of the useful idiot, um, in this, in this scenario, because whatever's going on is her getting more and that, that whole cadre, you know, cause it's not just Leslie Keen. um, getting played and getting getting sort of positioned into whatever it is this guy's doing you know yeah um i mean bottom line he just really he hasn't said you know there's some there's some interview where he was talking about alien bodies and and things like that but again like hadn't seen him didn't have any specifics i i just yeah, it's just all like awfully vague. There's not like an inciting incident that he's pointing to. You know, it's not like I don't know. It's not like he has like a a a a cash landrum or something like that that he can be like, see, this is how I know. You know, I have the right. documentation on this. You know, whatever that was. Yeah, he's um, got this weird story about the. Mussolini finding the UFO in 1933. Actually, I take it back. That's a good one. And that, uh, that is a good one. I feel like I've heard it before, though. Yeah, he's not somewhere. I, um, vaguely familiar. But then the next thing is like his other big thing is oh, Lockheed Martin has materials. 
I mean, well, I've heard that material shit multiple times now. Maybe Thirty years at least, if not longer. Yeah. Um, the meta materials. I mean, okay, so <laughs> the meta materials like. That that refers to that New York Times article, right? And that and that sort of become the shorthand for anytime anybody says they have like a little, you know, a little uh, ball or, or or flake of um, you yeah. know, unknown material recovered at a supposed UFO crash site or or whatever. But but before that, you know, and and what it usually turns out to be is someone says I had, you know, one flake of this, um, this unknown piece of metal analyzed and it's, it's a remarkably pure, um, you know, uh, alloy that we don't have the capacity to produce on, on earth without spending some like insane exorbitant amount of, you know, trillions of dollars to like make it. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of like what those things are usually talking about. And so the question, you know, for, for people that are trying to study it is like, well, all right. So like where, where does this like impossibly pure thing come from if we can't make it on earth, you know, air quotations, but he's talking about, you know, he, what he's saying is that there's like, I mean, I believe he said there were like fully intact spaceships or whatever, you know, you know, interdimensional, which, you know, the way these people talk about it is like fucking Rick and Morty or something, right? Like, it's just like, oh, I don't know, a, a space, a, a, a flying machine came through a portal in the sky and yeah, you know, from another dimension. Like, what, what is that? That doesn't he, mean anything. You, Joe Rogan asked him at one point, he says, what do you think the nature of these are? Yeah. And he really pays, but which, because I think there is a recognition in the ufological community or whatever, whatever that is that uh, there's a real recognition that alternative um, non ETH theories have gained ground in the last 10 years. Yeah, sure. And so Grish is like throwing out Jacques Vallée and he's throwing out interdimensional things and he's throwing all that stuff out, out there of, of what, what that is. So they're like, you know, he's just saying non-human intelligence, you know, he really kind of like hedging their bets on like what we're actually dealing with. Sure. I mean, that, and why not? But, but also uh, the way, if you really want to have that conversation, I guess it, it needs to be, you know, it, it I guess <laughs> it's more sophisticated than Joe Rogan asking, well, what is that? yeah right like if you're talking about other dimensions like i it just seems like the way that people in ufo lands talk about that is like it's like albelic talking about time travel like it just it it just sounds fake it sounds like it's from a a a movie you know um I, i don't really think that like the the way that we're sort of like uh modeling other dimensions it, it's not just like you know uh, my house is the same but um you know like the colors are different or something like that you know or there's an exact copy of me in this other place um that that seems like w- just just too simple and 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 silly and um so i don't know when when guys like this start talking about things like that i just kind of <laughs> I, I just got to chuckle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great discussion. I want to thank you for, for, for being a, for being a part of this tonight. And, uh, uh, Sir Fiel should be back next week, but thank you so much for filling in and, 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 uh, filling in the spot tonight. Yeah. It's, I'm a conspiracy. Normal is very dear to me. Both of you guys, uh, Thank you. So, uh, happy to uh, happy to spend a Tuesday night uh, chatting about uh, all kinds of made up and real stuff. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, for for being a part of this. And uh, guys, we also thank Maxim Furick for for coming on tonight. Uh, we're going to be have about two or three more episodes, I think, through the rest of the year. Uh, one of which is going to be the year in review, but uh, coming up. 
We're going to have uh, Drew Hurst Beeson going to talk about Yuba County Five and uh, Zodiac Killer, and uh, probably talk a lot about DB Cooper as well, who he thinks DB Cooper is. So uh, that's another one. And then uh, finishing off the year, like we always do, will be Doctor Future to uh, give us his predictions and his thoughts for 2024 and 2023 so but uh also guys uh conspiracy normal patreon that is available hopefully we get into patreon we real kind of lack some dude patreons lately but uh, that will hopefully change fairly soon especially as we get into the new year uh but if you guys want to contribute to us if you like what we do that is uh www.patreon.com slash conspiranormal and guys we will uh see you on the next episode